It's my nerd world, and welcome to it, a Star Wars podcast. Up front, if you hear whining in the background, that is my nine-month-old black-mouthed cur dog, Artie. She likes to whine a lot. It's the most talkative dog I've ever met in my entire lifetime. She happens to be hanging out in my room right now while I record this week's uh, podcast. So on the show, apart from my whining dog, Marvel's Kevin Feige talks uh, Star Wars. Also, uh, the art director for The Rise of Skywalker posts uh, a rather, in my opinion, innocuous Instagram picture along with, uh, with some comments. And I don't know if it's the lack of news right now or what, but many articles have been written. Uh, many uh, of those in the fandom that don't like the Rise of Skywalker are using this particular post as a means to trash the movie even further. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and get to your listener feedback. I'm glad you're with the show. Uh, you are listening to a Star Wars podcast. Let's get to it. It's an instinct. The feeling the force brought us together. We're not alone. Good people will fight if we lead them. People keep telling me they know me. No one does. Long have I waited, and now you're coming together. Is your undoing? Fear is the destiny of a Jedi. Your destiny. <laughs> the Force will be with you. Always. It is a Star Wars podcast. I am your host, John Justice, here for My Nerd World, and I'm glad you're with the show again this week. So, what Star Wars have you been consuming lately? Email me, talkshownerd at gmail.com, or leave a comment up on YouTube. It's a question that I, I don't think that I've asked before, but it's something on the show that I'd like to do moving forward, because I'd, I'd, I'm really curious... How often you consume Star Wars? Are you reading? Are you watching some of the animated, the live action? Are you watching the films? I, I, I'd really like to know. Um, this week I watched a little bit of, and told you, my dog, my whiny dog, Artie. I'm doing the show. She's been quiet this whole time that I've been prepping the show today. She hasn't said anything. And the moment I started talking, she started whining well it is coming up on lunchtime so she may she may bolt upstairs here in a, in a, in a bit um i did some watching i started rewatching uh season one of the mandalorian uh this this past week and um just working through and, and really i really wanted to watch season two uh because I, I i just i find myself normally i find myself gravitating more towards newer star wars uh, probably why I watch the the sequel trilogy as often as I as I do. Uh, but I was like, you know what? I hadn't watched the um, season one of The Mandalorian since before season two came out. So I just started working through it again, and uh, just I mean, just such an enjoyable show. It's different Star Wars. The pacing is different than what we get in the uh, in the theatrical releases. But I was uh, but I was really enjoying it. Also, I've been watching um, watched a few of the the Bad Batch episodes from season seven. Uh, and actually I've been watching way more Star Wars than I thought. And, uh, Kyle, my 14 year old and I have been, have watched, um, we've been working through Rebels again. Uh, I've got Rogue One sort of parked, ready to go today. The family went 
north here in Minnesota last night to go look at the Aurora Borealis. And I got a couple hours here once I get this done. And I think I may end up watching Rogue One. But I want to know what you're, what are you watching? What are you watching and why? I'm really, really I'm really curious. All right, we do have some listener feedback, so we'll uh, we'll get to some of your comments from the uh, from the past week a little bit uh, later on in the show. Not a lot going on news wise uh, this week. There was one particular item I mentioned it earlier that we will talk about, and that is uh, James Klein, the Lucasfilm and ILM director, uh, put up an Instagram post and 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 just a lot of people ran with it. So it's again, it's. It's up for debate and opinion what this actually means, but I'm going to lend my two cents to some of the, the negativity. So uh, let's dive into the one one news item uh, that broke uh, later this week. This is not going to go the way you think. So it was announced last year that uh, Marvel boss Kevin Feige uh, would be helming or will be involved in some way with a future Star Wars film. Uh, a lot of excitement uh, around that. Um, certainly, I'm excited by that. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of, of Kev, what Kevin Feige's done with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the guy um, and the live action now. Uh, the, the, um, the, the start, the first episode of Winter Soldier was good. Different. It felt a lot like the first episode of WandaVision, so kind of setting the stage. Uh, the action sequence, though, was ridiculously good. And um, <laughs> did you hear the dog? Uh, the the uh, the the opening action sequence in in uh, in the uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier. What did I say a moment ago? I don't think I said that. Yeah, Falcon and Winter Soldier was really really good. Um, but yeah, I'm a big fan of Kevin Feige. So him doing a Star Wars movie gets me excited. This is what he had to say though. Um, Feige isn't planning a major push into Star Wars beyond the movie that he's producing. Uh, no, Marvel Studios president Kevin Feige is not planning to push into the Star Wars space, even though he has his own movie in the works. As pre previously reported, the architect of the Marvel Cinematic Universe is developing a new Star Wars movie for Lucasfilm. But the man himself tells EW Entertainment Weekly in an interview... Um, for the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, that his involvement with the galaxy far, far away will not extend to the multitude of TV shows now in the works for Disney+. Plus. He said, uh, and I do that thing with my fingers, no, that's all Kathleen Kennedy, Feige said, referring to the president of Lucasfilm. I'm involved in as much as I stay up until midnight, Los Angeles time to watch new episodes of The Mandalorian when they drop. Uh, Disney did announce in September, oh, excuse me, of 2019, so it was almost, so we're, we're going back about a year and a half, um, that Feige, a known Star Wars fan, will produce a new movie uh, for the franchise with Kathleen Kennedy. With the close of the Skywalker saga, Kathy is pursuing a new era in storytelling, and knowing what a diehard fan uh, Kevin is, it made sense for these two extraordinary producers to work on a Star Wars film together. Uh, Alan Horn, co-chairman and chief uh, creative officer of uh, the Walt Disney Studios, said that at the uh, at the time. So not a, not, not a huge surprise, apart from the fact that getting back to the rumor mill and what some of the more negative uh, sites like to go and run with, um, talking about Kathleen Kennedy getting booted out and all this kind of nonsense and Kevin Feige taking over, um, just sort of putting that to bed, that no, he's just going to be producing... Uh, producing the film, but not doing anything further. So this next one's interesting, uh, and it's kind of funny and, and timely because last week talking about uh, The Rise of Skywalker again, and I had uh, talked briefly about the that end montage sequence and what I had kind of envisioned the end of The Rise of Skywalker could be and what they ended up giving us in The Rise of Skywalker, which I quite enjoyed, and going and looking back at the previous films, it fits in quite nicely. A quick little montage of going around the galaxy to see the fall of the First Order to sort of establish that, yes, the First Order has fallen. We um, we kind of got the, 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 the visit to different planets at the end, end of Revenge of the Sith, but of course, at the end of Return of the Jedi, we did go to those multiple locations, and the sequel trilogy was certainly aligned more with the original trilogy, um in terms of the the poetry of the of the two 
um, of the two trilogies together, right? So it mirrored the original trilogy more than it did the the prequel trilogy. So um, this particular article comes from Bounding Into Comics, and they are covering a story that was done by a YouTuber who goes by the name of Not My Star Wars. So I think right up front, you know the opinion of this particular YouTuber. Uh, There were multiple articles written about this, and the vast majority of articles were all saying the same thing. That is, just like the headline of this Bounding in the Comics article, Lucasfilm and ILM art director James Klein reveals just how rushed Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker was. This is another situation where, in my opinion, it depends on your point of view. If you're looking for things to try to substantiate your negative feelings about that film, I can certainly understand why you would go and lean on, look, this is an example of why it was rushed and why it wasn't good. I'm going to look at this from the other perspective as an individual that loves The Rise of Skywalker And also knows, because I watch a lot of documentaries, not just about Star Wars, but all films, um, most productions are rushed. And the really big ones that have a lot riding on them usually have last-minute changes that take place. Now, The Rise of Skywalker, I'm not going to hide the fact that with with the change in directors from Colin Trevorrow to J.J. Abrams, his picking up of Chris Terrio. They moved the date to allow for more time. But this was also a film that had a lot writing on it. And J.J. Abrams, as we'll work through the article, was very vocal about how they kept tweaking things right until the end. So you can go two ways on this. You can look at it, like I said, if you didn't like The Rise of Skywalker, you can say, man, if they had had more time, then we would have gotten something better. But there's no way of knowing that, so it's all opinion, as is my opinion, that just because they were tweaking it until the end doesn't mean that it, the movie would have been better, because I really love the film. All right, so let's dive into what this article had to say. As uncovered by YouTuber Not My Star Wars, Klein, who has been working for ILM since 2013, when he came on board for The Force Awakens, detailed just how horribly rushed the production was in a number of Instagram posts where he shared concept art from the film. Okay, so as somebody who... Hey, my doggy's back. As somebody who covers news for a living, because I'm a host of a, of a news talk show, um, I can tell you firsthand that that was injecting of opinion right there detailed just how horribly rushed the production was. No, the Instagram guy made some comments about the end of the film and the time that they had. It doesn't necessarily mean that it was horribly rushed. Okay, that's opinion. Just wanted to point that out. And I guess probably more to the point, I don't believe that the that the art director, James Klein's intention when he put those posts up was to complain about the film. Right, and that's probably more of what I would say. Detailed, um, he he makes the con- Klein, who's been working for Lucasfilm, detailed how horribly rushed the production was. No, this guy was just putting a post, and he had a caption to it. So, in an Instagram post back in November of 2020, Klein shared concept art for a Mon Calamar, uh, Cal- Calamari cruiser. He captioned the post, writing "Mon Calamari variant for the Battle of Exegol." At the time in the production, we desperately needed more ships. Over the span of a day or so, I kit-bashed the Home One ship to fill out our fleet when you gotta do what you gotta do. Okay. So, they needed more ships for the Battle of Exegol. That could have been as simple as J.J. Abrams saying, we need more ships for the Battle of Exegol. I I, I failed to see... (laughs) How that is a demonstration of how horribly rushed the production was. Okay, he continues. More recently, Klein shared a shot from the ending of The Rise of Skywalker showing a Star Destroyer um, crashing into Bespin. Okay, first off, that's wrong. The Star Destroyer wasn't crashing into Bespin. The Star Destroyer was falling in the sky, crashing um, 
f- as it passed by Bespin. It wasn't crashing into Bespin. Okay, just wanted to point that out. He wrote, part of a quick montage at the end of The Rise of Skywalker. Fun building Bespin under pressure. Only had a day to work this out because it was late in production and we were under the gun. Okay. So the idea for that montage at the end of the film came late in production. All right. Klein then added, note, scale of the Star Destroyer is way off, mainly because the team was looking for dramatic composition. All right. That's not a huge surprise. Now, the article goes on to say, the fact that the Rise of Skywalker was rushed shouldn't surprise anyone. Director J.J. Abrams made it clear on multiple occasions that the film was going through significant changes a little over a month before the film was released in the theaters. Okay. Okay. Speaking with Entertainment Weekly in November of 2019, Abrams stated, we always knew we were going to have uh, three fewer months to uh, post-production this film. Okay. Then he added, so so much is still being worked on. It's literally a practical race to get it finished. Um, Then in an interview with Rolling... Now, let me stop here real quick. It's interesting, too, because... There's a, there's a couple different ways you can look at this as well. That three fewer months going into post-production of the film is interesting, and they were working right up to the end of the film. If you go back and look at the production of The Last Jedi, uh, Ryan Johnson finished the production of The Last Jedi, like I think, three months early. So, again, it's not necessarily that they had less time. It's just they finished closer to to production which 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 understandably and being fair doesn't allow you any opportunity to make further adjustments so maybe the argument could be made that the last jedi right actually had quite a few changes but they still had plenty of buffer of which to work which still kind of makes me laugh because i'm going to assume that the people complaining about the the like the the not my star wars guys um probably also didn't like the last jedi and that got done with production early but be that as it may let's continue with the article uh let's see he stated, but the process has really just been, as one might expect, talking through the story, finding things that make us emotional and going with our gut as best we can, listening to critiques and criticisms and trying to make it better as we go, not being afraid of the better idea. I really, really love that quote. And I'm going to go back to friend of the show and host of Page Turners They Were Not, Brennan Marr, who made that comment a while back about how he gauges enjoying films on an emotional level, and I do as well, and I, I'll never forget that, and it's something that I'll carry with me in my commentary now moving forward, is that I I base my enjoyment of a film on how it makes me feel emotionally, not whether or not the Star Destroyer was too big in the background as it fell behind a best bin in a particular shot, not based off of the knowledge that I have that this film was finished right before it was, you know, right until a few weeks before it was released or a week before it was, it was released. I base it off of how it makes me feel. It's like, it's why I love watching Star Wars movies. And it's why I love The Rise of Skywalker so much, because that movie makes me feel good. It gives me a two and a half hour dopamine hit. Uh, He went on to say, usually we talk through a scene and then we'll go off and write different scenes and then share them and then do passes with each other's scenes and come up with something. And he's been great, not just in the writing of the movie, but during the movie and even in post, helping make it better, losing things that we keep trying to make work but don't and realizing let's just cut it. He's here now, he's downstairs, talking about Chris Terrio, Abrams Explained. Uh, The article goes on to say, as for Abrams saying he wasn't afraid of the better idea, that appears to be a load of crap. As Not My Star Wars points out in his video, Clyde's concept art reveals significantly better designs for what showed up in the film. Okay, that's pure opinion. Now, I will say that what I'm about to mention here is something that perhaps I would have liked to have seen. But without actually seeing it play out on film, I have absolutely no way to know whether or not that would have looked better. So the example that he uses here, right, is on May 4th, 2020, Klein revealed concept art of Exegol, showing the Star Destroyers rising up out of the hangars. He explained initially the thought was to see individual hangars for the Star Destroyers to emerge from. We eventually... um, went with a more living dead from the grave approach, kind of like both 
Notice the early design for the beacon in the background. So, again, I really liked the concept art of seeing hangar bays opening up and the Star Destroyers coming out of the ground. But I also admit that seeing those Star Destroyers coming up from the cracked surface of Exegol is really, really rad. So this idea of, as for Abrams saying he wasn't afraid of a better idea, that appears to be a load of crap because there were better designs than what showed up in the film. Well, that's just opinion. Back to Abrams, the article says. The director did admit on November 25th that he had had just completed the film the day before. He told George Snuffleupagus, um, just yesterday, yes, it's done, now people have to see it. He then seemingly confirmed they were still doing reshoots in October. It's really no surprise the movie was as bad as it was, writes the article. <laughs> in your opinion, dude, I loved it. As Not My Star Wars says, this is what happens when you don't know or love Star Wars. This is what happens when you try to make films that took George Lucas three years each to make, and you try to make them in one year. No detail, no love, no care, no understanding. Just make movies to make money. All right, everyone's entitled to, to, to their opinion. I couldn't disagree with any of that more. He then added, and this is the result that you get. Ridiculous scale, total disregard for canon, just an overall mess. What do you make of Klein's revelation that he had to finish the number of projects in less than a day? Um, I don't care because I watch documentaries and I know that that happens all the time. And if you go back to that other comment in the, uh, in the article, you know, J.J. Abrams talks about the fact that finding things that make us emotional and going with our gut the best that we can. You know, and that's that's the thing about the creative process. As somebody that, you know, does radio, uh, writes stories, you know, you can't you can't make something that's going to make everybody happy. You can get close, but I'm very much of the opinion that you do what you what makes you happy, what brings you joy, right? You be the most uh, most genuine and authentic person as possible. And create the most authentic and genuine thing that makes you happy. And you'll reach the biggest audience you're, you're capable of reaching. You'll reach um, the, uh, you know, as many readers as you're capable of, of reaching. That go and read, and read your stories. That's how I write my stories. I write stories that thrill me. These are things that I would love to see on the big screen. These are scenes and ideas and thoughts that I think are a ton of fun. If other people dig them, awesome. If they don't, there's nothing I can do uh, about that. And I have a very different approach uh, than than most people do when it comes to content creation, and and um, I, uh, I I kind of prefer when you have a singular vision, and I like to just go with my gut. I don't go back and do a lot of rewrites on my book, on my books, because I prefer to have what's there on the page be the one idea. I'll tweak certain things to make them work better, but when it comes to action sequences and thoughts, usually that instinctive reaction that I had is the is the best one. The more that I start tink tinkering with it, um, that's when I start thinking, well, I wonder if people will like this and people will like that. And, and I know that that pushes back against the way most people go and create entertainment. Uh, it remains to be seen whether or not oh, uh, in the big picture it's going to help or hinder my particular uh, books. But I think you can look at The Last Jedi as a really good example of a film, depending on what your feeling is on it. Um, I happen to think it's a masterpiece, but Ryan Johnson directed and wrote that. And so I think a reason why it's so good is for that is for that very reason. Um, but at the same time, like I said, I also love The Rise of Skywalker and find that film infinitely rewatchable and jj abrams co-wrote that one just like he co-wrote the force awakens with lawrence kasdan talk show nerd at gmail.com you can also uh, leave a comment up on youtube let's get to some of your listener feedback this week i need someone to show me my place in all this Got a couple of comments. First off, a friend of the show, Miranda, writes this. I'm going to make a couple of sections in my scrapbook dedicating to The Last Jedi and The Rise of Skywalker separately since they are that special. And let's be honest. The more these folks talk about Kathleen Kennedy and other people such as Ryan Johnson, J.J. Abrams, Chris Terrio, and Gina Carano, you name it, they're only making them even more famous, pushing them forward in the limelight. I mean, look at Ryan Johnson right now. He is becoming quite the rock star at the moment. Uh-oh, doggy's back. 
Um, thank you, Miranda. Always appreciate the comment. Miranda, um, uh, Irene writes this. That was an excellent podcast, John. Thank you very much, Irene. Now she's nesting on my bed. I could not agree more. You have voiced what I think. And uh, without Star Wars, I am joyless. I love Star Wars, especially the last two. Thank you once again. One of the best podcasts ever. Wow, the joy is back. Thank you, Irene. I really do appreciate that. Stephanie S. writes this. Hi, John. It's been a while. I have been able to make peace with The Rise of Skywatcher, and I do watch it occasionally. I do wish that somehow, some way, Ben would someday uh, make an appearance, though. Have a great day. Um, a lot of people do, Stephanie. And I'm sure that Disney and Lucasfilm know that. Never say never. Um, all right. And then we got a, a lengthy one here that I want to share with you from friend of the show, Dale Ehrnman, who writes this. Hera was always going to be in Rangers of the New Republic. They released that information to take some of the focus off of Cara Dune being removed. I think Gina Carano may have taken the job or at least had an offer from Ben Shapiro, which made it easier to ignore prompts to apologize to Disney for something many people believe she shouldn't have pushed to. Um, many people believe she shouldn't have pushed to pushed to apologize should have been pushed to apologize excuse me she shouldn't have been pushed to apologize for by her agent and publicist is that the right word furthermore uh, they may have instigated her removal from the mandalorian and further contracts from disney and lucasfilm it's entirely possible that ben shapiro helped her with a plan to play a sympathy card to pull fans from disney to his network um, I believe her when she said she didn't intend what people thought she meant uh, by either of her posts on Twitter. Again, there's no such thing as bad publicity. Gino will be just fine wherever she goes, and the angry mob mentality fans are bringing more attention to Star Wars Channel on YouTube. I'm excited to hear what Bob Chapek said about Kathleen Kennedy. I don't think people are patient enough to hold true. I think George Lucas unintentionally let things slip too far in the past. Bringing it into the present is a tough job. And I think that Kath uh, Kathleen has, so far, made a few missteps and let a few continuity mistakes slip. I have faith. Uh, I have faith. We'll ensure it gets better. Everyone wants to point a finger at someone, and Kathleen has made one major mistake uh, herself. However, I feel like there's no such thing as bad publicity. The only thing I think she did wrong was push back at the backlash of the EU fans had at making it Legends and further uh, flamed all of that by the fandom menaces reaction to The Last Jedi. One of the things, and thank you for the comment, uh, Dale. You know, one of the things, and we talk about this quite, uh, qu quite a lot on the on the radio show uh, that I host. Um, but one of the things that um, I constantly take into consideration when it comes to content creation, and especially Star Wars and the way that Disney has rolled out all of their content since they purchased it from Lucasfilm, and that is. There is and there was no way to know what kind of world we would be living in, right, in 2021. And I'm not even talking COVID, but what world we would be living in in 2021 when Disney and Lucasfilm uh, ended up buying um, buying the rights of Star Wars from George Lucas going all the way back to pre-2015. I think it was 2012 when they made the announcement, right? Because... You know, social networking and the way the media is now has completely changed. And with that, so has the fandom and how vocal the fandom has become. I think my quick little hot take on that and what I'm trying to articulate is that I think that in the beginning there was a thought and it was a rational thought that we couldn't that that Disney could pump out Star Wars product and the fans would come and watch it because they'd always done that. And you could have multiple projects in multiple timelines and the fans would come and watch it. And they started to do that. They did that, obviously, with The Force Awakens. And then they did that, obviously, with Rogue One. And then, of course, you have the controversy that followed The Last Jedi. But when you track the trajectory of the changing of the media and the way that information is disseminated, and the number of individuals in, the, in parts of the fandom doing podcasts, right, and commenting on Twitter. All of that started when The Force Awakens started. 
I'm a perfect example of that. I started my podcast pre The Force Awakens because I wanted to talk more Star Wars. And suddenly all these podcasts show up and they all started using social networking. And that grew and grew and grew and grew and grew and and really kind of hit its peak when The Last Jedi came out. It's not to say that people wouldn't have had the opinions that they had about The Last Jedi. It is to say that at that moment in time when The Last Jedi came out, the fandom was at a fever pitch of creating content and talking about Star Wars. And we had two successful films. And then The Last Jedi comes out, and it's challenging to a lot of people. And now you have more people on the internet than ever commenting about Star Wars, and suddenly everything turns. So the idea, for example, of I do think they should have waited to release Solo in December, but I think that Bob Iger was correct at the time in assuming that releasing it six months after The Last Jedi wasn't necessarily a bad idea. They were going off of the formula that had worked so far, but hadn't taken into account because nobody could have ever have realized what podcasting, what Twitter, what social networking, what YouTube was going to do to the fandom. And they found out with the release of Solo. And it wasn't good. That's what I think happened with regard to that. And I just wanted to comment on that based off of Dale's comment about uh, about Kathleen Kennedy and any sort of missteps that may have taken place. Um, I'm willing to cut a ton of slack to most of those content creators because we just live in a really, really weird time right now. Right, There's no doubt about it. Things are not uh, the way that they used to be when those films came out. Uh, certainly the original trilogy, but not the prequels, and not even when The Force Awakens and Rogue One came out. Thank you so much for checking out the show. Thank you to everybody who has purchased um, any of my Embark Science Fiction Space Opera Series books, but more, more specifically, um, The Rocket Queen, which just came out last week, book five in my series. I hope you've had an opportunity to go pick it up. Um, people seem to really be enjoying it, and I hope that you will go and pick up your copy in ebook or paperback. I'm still working on the audiobook. Uh, today, though, it's a plea for reviews. If you have picked up the book and read it, please go to Amazon.com and leave a review of The Rocket Queen. I need some reviews for that book as soon as possible. I know it's only been out a week, so uh, hopefully for more of you faster readers, you've read it. Uh, go right now to Amazon.com and leave a review for the book or any of the books. If you've read them, enjoyed them, and have not left a review, it would really, really mean a lot to me if you could go and uh, leave a, a review on Amazon for all the books and specifically uh, Embark, The Rocket Queen, Book 5. All right, that wraps up the show this week. I hope that you have a uh, fantastic rest of your weekend and week ahead, and we will talk to you again very soon. The Force will be with you. Always. My nerd road. <laughs>